Hello, I'm Tsukat and welcome back to the second channel geography video. This is obviously a series where we talk about geography and the world and stuff. And today I want to talk about an aspect of geography we don't really talk about a lot on the channel, but it is something I'm really passionate about and it's something that really does need to be brought up when it comes to Canada because there are so many things to love about Canada, but one of its biggest problems is that it has a real transportation, a real issue of getting from one part of the country to any other part. The country is very poorly linked together, perhaps the worst of any you know major Western country. And I want to talk about exactly why that is the case today because it is important to know. And to kind of give an analogy to start this video off, uh, I recently went on a 42 pound flight, a 56 US dollar flight from the UK to Canada and then back to Ireland. And people in the you know Europe hear that and they're like, wow, that's a really good flight deal. People in Canada hear that and they're like, nope, I don't believe you. Or, oh, so you work for the airline and you're lying to me. Or, oh, you did something inappropriate, someone who does work for the airline. They literally can't believe that's possible because even hour long flights in Canada, even less than an hour flights can cost upwards of $400, which is so absurd on the surface. I looked into it, but that seems to be the minimum price on even budget airline flights in Canada. So what's the deal with why is, you know, flying in Canada so expensive? Why are trains in Canada so expensive? Why is the country so poorly linked up by roads? Because all of Canada's transportation, all of the links which bring the country together, all have kind of issues. So yeah, before we start, I want to just kind of mention that although Canada is the second or fourth biggest country in the world. It depends on how you measure land area. We're gonna say second, but if you wanna believe fourth, that's fine. Um, but basically, uh, no matter, it's either the second or fourth biggest country. But if you look at it on the Mercator projection map, because it is so far north, it gets very distorted. So this is one of the times where Mercator is gonna give us some issues. We're gonna use the globe map instead. This is what Canada really looks like on an actual globe, you know, it's actual land area. So just keep in mind that it looks a bit smaller than it does on most uh, flat maps, but it's still a huge, huge country. And despite being so huge, most of the people don't live in most of the land. In fact, uh, these three territories, up, these three states up here, uh, Yukon Territory, Northwest Territories, and Nunavut are, you know, they have about 60,000 people a pop. It's it's really, really tiny in terms of how many people live in these huge, vast territories. They're not even provinces of Canada. Most people live in the 10 provinces, and of the people who live in these provinces, they all live very, very far south. Most of them live right next to the border with the US, as you can see right here. Uh, the biggest population centers are right down here, right next to the US border. There's also a big one in Vancouver. Um, and even the people who live north of the border, you can see they live very far south compared to Canada's ex uh, territorial extent. When, when you get even halfway across the states, all of the population density just goes down to pretty much nothing. So, uh, and then if you look at the territories, you can see there's some very tiny yellow, you know, the lowest it can be on this map before just a big sea of white. So most people in Canada don't live in most places. They live in cities like, uh, you know, Toronto, they live in Quebec, and they live in Vancouver, which are the first, second, and third biggest cities in Canada. So uh, yeah, it's also worth noting that even of the people who live in the 10 provinces, who live in the south of those 10 provinces, so cut these uh, provinces in half, uh, then most of those people live in Ontario and uh, Quebec. Uh, again, how you want to pronounce those two, it's up to you, it's fine. Uh, but most people live over here in these two places. It's about 21 and a half of uh, the 35 million people who live in Canada live just in these two provinces. And again, live very, very close uh, by each other. So yeah, most of Canada is all the way on the east right here, both in terms of number of provinces, because you know, it's like six, and also in terms of just sheer volume of people with the only big settlements on the east being Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, etc. So yeah, now we've got that out of the way. We've got the fact that people in Canada live in weird places. The country is huge, but most of the settlements, like Yellowknife is great. It's a place you should visit. I'd love to someday, but it's very remote. It's very far away from anyone who lives anywhere. Same with Whitehorse, same with all of these cities. You can start to begin to understand how like, oh yeah, I can see how a country this big, you know, let's say the distance from, you know, the closest major city to Yellowknife, uh, let's say Calgary. Uh, Edmonton's pretty big too, but you know, if you want to go from Calgary to Yellowknife, oh, that's a uh, thousand kilometers. Or if we go from Edmonton, oh, that's still, a thousand kilometers <laughs> and you have to go around a lake because there's a huge lake in the way. I can see how that might start to be problematic. Like we don't have many thousand kilometer uh, roads between two cities with very little in between, but that is Canada's big problem. So yeah, when we first start talking about road, because I think uh, road is the first uh, place we should start, um, there is something called the Trans Canada, uh, yeah, the Trans Canada Highway. Um, you know, you can see it on the map because it's literally, it's you know, when when the U.S. has a bunch of intercities, there's like number ten and fifteen, etc. The U.K. has a bunch of motorways. Germany has a bunch of autobahns. There's really only one uh, Trans Canada map, uh, you know, um, highway. It kind of splits up in a few places. Uh, you can see right here, there's a few places where it goes into two, but it is mostly just one big route that then has a few off branches. So it's called number one here, as you can see, but up here it's the 16, for instance. But yeah, it's mostly the same uh, big thing. But the problem with this big road that goes across the country, one, you can see the big problem looking at this map already, like, ah, oh, goes very far south, pretty much anything north of there, like 
good luck getting people there. But the other problem is the fact that it actually has one point of failure. You might not be able to spot it on this map, but right here, you can see it goes all the way into one plane. And the, the crazy thing about that one point, if you're curious, it's halfway through Ontario, as you can see right here. Halfway through the, uh, you know, uh, basically halfway through Ontario is where Canada basically splits into east and west. There is one bridge across this, uh, you know, like <laughs> one bridge connecting the eastern half of Canada to the western half of Canada via the Trans Canada Ra Railroad, uh, sorry, the Trans Canada Highway. And the crazy thing about that Trans Canada Highway is that it's currently only one lane in each direction. They're currently trying to extend it to be two lanes in each direction, but this means that when those two lanes have gone down, as uh, you know, they did at one point, that's why they've been working on it more. You can see in Street View being worked on right now, should be finished very soon. Well, should be finished last year, but will be finished very soon. But basically when this bridge goes down, there is no way to get supplies from Eastern Canada to Western Canada. And in fact, even when the bridge isn't down, there's a lot of journeys between the major cities in Canada that literally involve saving a lot of time by not going through Canada. Let's take Toronto to Vancouver again. First to third biggest city, I think it's third. But you know, take uh, two of the biggest cities in the country, fastest way to go mostly through the US. If you wanna go through Canada, you lose a lot of time on the same route. And although crossing the border twice not, might not be ideal, especially after they legalized uh, cannabis, I believe, it's really hard to get from Canada to the US. There's a big delay on, in regards to that because Again, they've got to check you for that sort of stuff. It's long story on that, fun story in fact. But yeah, basically, long story short, getting from any of the major population centers to the other often can involve going through the US, and that is usually the fastest route for some of the major routes you might do. And uh, yeah, this is one of the problems with having your population center be so close to another country, but yet because there is a border, you can't necessarily connect to that country so well, which means that there's a big, I get, you know, horizontal thing in uh, you know, Canada, but going anywhere vertical gets real problematic. So now we've spoken about the road problem, Let's Let's talk about the rail problem. So there's only one uh, company providing passenger services throughout Canada, and that is Via Rail. So this is the Via Rail passenger network. And again, you can see like, ah, it's it's quite lacking, isn't it? Although <laughs> it does go a little bit further north than the, uh, the highway network. And it's like, ah, you can go to Churchill up there. The fares on this network are prohibitively expensive. It costs hundreds of dollars to go from any one city to another. Uh, it doesn't cover all 10 of the provinces. So again, highway at least technically covers the 10. Oh, I forgot to mention a key thing. This is true for the rail, but it's really important for the road. If you want to get to the 10th uh, province of Canada, Newfoundland, Newfoundland, I would have, th this one right here that <laughs> people make fun of my pronunciation of. Um, but if you want to get to the 10th province of Canada, there is a 12 hour ferry involved. Uh, I'm, again, I was in St. John's recently and he said that and I'm like, it's not 12 hours. He's like, yep, it's 12 hours. Yep, if you want to get from St. John's, the major population center on this island to, uh, you know, even just Nova Scotia, the next province over, it is literally uh, something like a 10 hour drive across the province and then it's 12 hours if you want to get. So let's say you want to go to the capital of, uh, you know, Nova Scotia, uh, Halifax or the biggest city at least. It's gonna take you 21 hours and 24 minutes because there's a 12 hour ferry just to get to the nearest major city. If you wanna to go to one that's actually one of the biggest in the country, say Montreal, it's two days just to get from there to there. There is a serious problem in connectivity because of the distances involved. And this also means that there's just no passenger rail services to the 10th province. There is nine provinces worth of passenger services and they just kind of leave it, leave it out over there because you know what? Getting it, it's just, it's just too tricky. And funnily enough, the uh, even though this passenger rail service, it goes to very few places in Canada. You can see it's literally a straight line through most places. They, uh, and not only is the fact that it's crazy expensive and it doesn't go many places, it's crazy unprofitable. The amount of subsidies they have to pour into this company year after year after year is a real problem. And long story short on why that is, is because in most countries, you know, rail operates along the biggest routes. However, in Canada, the Trans-Canada Highway was built kind of as a concession to uh, you know, mostly to British Columbia, but to other states too, to get them to join the union. And although on the surface that sounds great, it's just this perpetual expense that doesn't bring people in. You don't want to take a, f a free day, a seven day. It's a lot of days to get from one side to the other. You don't want to take a multiple day journey to the other side of Canada that costs $600. So even though they're charging so much that no one can do it besides very rich foreigners and people who just want to take a fun journey across their country, they lose a lot of money operating all these trains and they have to be bailed out, not bailed out, but they have to be funded by the government every year. The truth is though, despite that, there is a very profitable stretch in the VRL network. There is a stretch fit that probably could make money uh, and you know, technically would make money if it operated by itself. Because like, if you look at this map of Canada again, you can see there's a, rail, uh, there's a corridor of population going straight from Windsor down next to Detroit all the way up to Quebec City. It's just settlement, 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 settlement. Big city, big city, big city, big city. And funnily enough, 67% of the money on this entire network comes from just there 
to there. Just this point right here makes 67% of their money, but it's not 67% of their expenses. So even though they could be profitable, they have the public service obligation, which means that they charge crazy amounts and they're not profitable. And <laughs> it's just, a, it's a weird situation when, you know, it, it's impractical, expensive, and still funded by the government. But that's how the Canadian uh, rail system is. So yeah, as well as being poorly connected by road and by rail, you might be like, okay, here's the solution. Like in America, which has the most airports in the world, fun fact, at least paved airports, uh, like how America has a lot of airports and that's one of the solutions to getting people around uh, you know, far away places. What's the Canadian equivalent solution? Well, even though America is known for crazy expensive flights, if you've ever been there, uh, flights are expensive and they also generally, all, all three of the major, you know, like full service carriers, don't give full service, it's it's a bad thing. Fly, fly uh, I think it's Southwest in America. There they actually, the, the low cost carrier in America is the best one, surprisingly, weird fact about that. But even though America is crazy expensive despite that, Canada makes America look cheap. People in Canada genuinely like pine after how cheap it is to fly in America because flying in Canada is crazy, ridiculous expensive. And uh, to put this in uh, perspective, first of all, we'll uh, talk about the fact that there was a study done by some Canadian senators to try and, you know, work out like how much more expensive it was. So they did, uh, you know, like they took Detroit, they took Windsor, and they're like, okay, they both have international airports. As you can see, Detroit International Airport, Windsor International Airport, oh, sorry, Detroit International Airport, Windsor International Airport. There's also another non-international one here, but there's two huge international airports or big international airports. The average taxes and fees on a uh, Detroit bound flight was something like 13%. On a Windsor flight, 46% of the ticket was taxes and fees alone. And bear in mind, you know, 46% is really high, but given that the average uh, plane fare in uh, you know, Canada is about $400, that's pretty darn high. That's a lot of taxes and fees. So after you go through that huge chunk, just going to the government and going for fees and stuff, it's like, okay, what about all the other costs? Well, first of all is the fact that there used to be one company offering all these flights. It was Air Canada. Nowadays, there are multiple uh, airlines. There's uh, Sc Swoop, I want to say, just started. But uh, you know, th there's basically there's Air Canada, and then there's their low cost carrier a alternative, WestJet. And uh, oh, but and to kind of put this in perspective, that even WestJet, the low cost carrier, they recently started the route from oh, like recently in the last ten years from Halifax, Nova Scotia, the cities we just mentioned that are twenty four hours apart by road, uh, from Halifax to St John's. I got this included as part of my London to Halifax to St John to Ireland ticket. Again, it was really, really cheap. But the craziest thing is despite having three tickets, one was seven hours, one was an hour, one was four hours. The the one that I saved the most money on, if I had bought in cash, would have been Halifax to St. John's. That is a $350 ticket. That's the cheapest you can find if you're really lucky. It costs usually deep into the hundreds. If you want to buy one tomorrow, good luck spending less than, you know, like $800 on it. Again, look into all these flight prices, by the way. They are real. They are this crazy expensive. Flight prices in Canada are absurd, and part of it is taxes, part of it is fees. The other big parts of it are the fact that Canada has some of the highest overflight fees in the world, so their air traffic control is very expensive. Something, uh, I think it's something to do with unionization, but like it's a, you know, they have very expensive, you know, just flying, uh, you know, costs in terms of that sort of thing. They then also, on top of that, uh, almost every single airport in Canada is, uh, you know, publicly held. It's owned by the government, and uh, I hope this isn't like a controversial thing to say, but there's a lot of industries around the world where there is a good debate to be had as to like private or public. I really don't know which is best and you should consider both options. But generally speaking, countries with public airports, even though there's some you know, things you can guarantee as a result, prices go sky high. And Canada has, I believe it's the most expensive landing fees for a country in the world, not for an airport. The, I think that goes to Osaka in Japan, but they have some of the most expensive landing fees for any uh, you know, like flight. And because of this, going from a Canadian airport to a Canadian airport, even if they're that close, and even if you're saving money on the plane, on the, you know, on the, all of the international stuff, uh, you're saving money on the fuel, all of these different things you can save money on a short flight, but going from a Canadian airport to a Canadian airport, the landing fees on both sides are just so absurd because you're paying them twice as opposed to once on international flight that there are, you know, it's cheaper to fly from Canada to another country than it is to fly from Canada to Canada. Again, the St. John's to Island flight regularly on sale for about $250 versus <laughs> St. John's to Halifax over for, you know, about $350 when it's on sale, which sound, sounds like it's some fake thing. It sounds like BS, but it's a real legit thing. Uh, to put this in perspective, I looked up Air Canada's route network. They're the largest air, you know, airline in Canada. They have, I think it's uh, 57 Canadian destinations they fly to. They have more destinations than that just in the US. They have more, they, uh, yeah, Air Canada, Canada's airline flies all over Canada 
flies to more places in the US, and even if you exclude the US, it flies to more places in the world because that's where its root network is most profitable. Sounds absurd is a real thing because Canada seems to have uh, a lot of the worst of these sorts of things. And, you know, again, part of it is because they uh, they operate airports as like a... Because, you know, when, a, when an airport's publicly owned, there are benefits. But an airport that's publicly owned can't cost cut, cut costs in the same way that an airport that is privately owned is. Again, that's just fact across the world. I mean, look at, you know, Europe and Asia, two, two places of a lot of privatized airports, do have, you know, they have airports compete, they have airport fees. In Canada, there is one major airport per location generally. Again, you're flying to St. John's, you fly to St. John's, or you can fly something like four hours away to Gander International. Those are your two options, and they're both publicly owned airports anyway, so it's like, ah, darn. <laughs> By the way, Gander's over here. Uh, if, so, it, when you're in Canada, you kind of forget how big uh, distances can be. But the distance between these two places, if you wanted to, you know, fly to one and then save money by driving to the other, it's three hours and 17 minutes to the closest other airport. And uh, although Gander is a big airport, it's kind of an exception to this. Most places you have one airport to choose from, it's publicly owned, so they have not the same incentives in lowering costs. And if they did want to lower costs, because they're like, let's try and save money for the people, it's, you don't have the same response. In a, in a private industry, if you lower costs and people are unhappy, if they continue to use you because they decide, well, I'm unhappy, but I'd still like to use them, they still will. In a public system, people are unhappy, they can use politics to reverse that. Again, adding a political element to an element to a business which is trying to lower costs, generally not a good idea. You know, uh, when a government tries to lower budgets by 1%, or even tries to increase budgets by 1% less than last year, it is a, you know, like there's a big political tragedy over that. A company can lower costs by 5, 10% a year, and there's issues, you know, sometimes we'll get some bad press, but it's not quite the same thing. Applying, again, I'm trying to generalize hugely here. I'm not saying privatize everything. There's a lot of things that should be public, a lot of things that should be private. Again, there's a big debate for most things, but the because Canada's decided public airports, which are under so much pressure, flying to somewhere like St. John's International, it's a nice airport on the inside. Not right now, actually, fun fact about that in the vlog. But um, yeah, basically, there's a lot of benefits of it, and you might argue, but there's a lot of downsides that come with that. So yeah, now with that said, that's why flying in Canada is so expensive. Most expensive overflight fees, <laughs> most expensive airports, uh, you know, highest fees as a percentage of most developed countries. Uh, the rail system has the same problem where it has a bunch of public service obligations to places it can't make money on, but it still has to tr it's got, uh, you know, charge sky high fares because it can only attract you know, tourists doing weird routes. It can't attract regular visitors, which means if you want to get from Winnipeg to Vancouver, you won't take the train. You just you just won't. It's <laughs> it's going to be bad and all these sorts of things. Then on top of that, it's got competition from uh, bus services, which is starting up in Canada, which is a great thing for the consumer trying to save money, but the time taken is kind of absurd, kind of crazy. Uh, and the road network in Canada is one of the few things they can do kind of well. There's a lot of interesting examples when you look around the country. But the truth is, if you want to connect all of Canada up, it's not as easy as some other countries. The Although if you look at the UK, it's, you can, you either, there is a major road or there's a major road within like, you know what, like 10 kilometers off you because it's a very small island in terms of its population. It's very population dense. In the places where there's not, there's still a lot of roads. Like in the middle of Wales, very few people live there, but you can still have roads going through there because it connects another place to another place without too much of a detour in between. In Canada, you need to, if you want to go from, again, you want to pick a random uh, community uh, because Newfoundland and, and Labrador, it's very uh, remote. Most places actually, again, are very remotely connected with no roads to anywhere else. So if you look at Well Court Cove, nothing, no, no attachment to anywhere. You take a boat somewhere, that's about it. Maybe there's an airport in some of these. You can see there's an, there's an airport in Rankin Inlet. But most of these places are just entirely isolated because the cost of building to say Rankin Inlet by road would be not only you know, trying to work out a path through all of these lakes, then chopping down all the trees because it's a entirely untouched land for the most part through this, then it's thousands of kilometers as opposed to tens or hundreds. And that is why Canada is very poorly connected up with the rest of Canada. And yeah, now you know a little bit more about why your country might be well connected. And if, you know, because I think these videos are not only useful to be like, let's tear down everything about Canada. Here's what I think could go better. So again, everything here I'd like to believe is like a bit of facts and stuff. If I was in charge of Canada, because Canada's like, hey, we saw this video of yours and we're electing you prime minister. I don't know if Canada has a rule where you have to be Canadian citizen to join, but British, I, I think there's like a weird Commonwealth connection where I might be able to get Canadian citizenship. I, I don't know for sure. Um, 
But let's say I'm Prime Minister of Canada, what do I do to fix that? Well, the problem is, is the Trans-Canada Highway is always going to be reliant on this one bridge, which always can fail, and can cut Canada in half. However, uh, you can see around, like, you could make a trickier connection somewhere else, or you could try and make some new communities. I would, I would try something like that, like, okay, let's try and, you know, have a second thing up there and make a big stop over, you know, like, try and, I would say, a single point of failure, although it's almost a geographic necessity, I would say it's worth the amount of money it would be to just be like, okay, let's try and carve something up here. Like you can see right here how there's like almost something. You just need like a tiny bridge to like fully connect that. Then boom. Yeah. And then, you know, pave it over. Second, you know, redundancy. We got a second system just in case that fails. So that, that's what I do with the road network. Make sure there's less points of failure. And then, you know, maybe just for fun, just like, oh yeah, well in the North Alberta, there's a lot of oil. Build some roads up there of the oil money because that oil, uh, at least until recently, Canada was making a lot of money in oil. You don't, when you picture oil, you think of like a Saudi Arabia, but no, Canada is the country for that. So second thing, when you're like rail network, I think, honestly, um, you can keep the lines open, they're used for freight still, but keeping passenger services going that are used by tourists that you have to subsidize with your own government, I, I don't know what I feel about that. I think that what you need to do is you need to, again, rather than having $600 fares from you know, Halifax to Winnipeg or something, do um, like sales, do passes, do weird things. That's what made the UK rail network, even though you might hate the UK rail network success successful, but what makes it more successful now and more ridden by almost double than it was in the late 90s is the fact that there are so many different ways to get cheap tickets while still getting those full fares out of people like tourists that can't pay them. But yeah, trying to increase demand for the rail network sounds like an impossible thing, but throw some cheap fares on there. Uh, you know, try and do like a Canada pass that tourists can buy uh, where they can travel all the way up and down it or something. Uh, they actually, funnily enough actually, Canada had a all, like an all access pass for the entire rail network. They advertised it hugely. You could buy one for $150, travel anywhere across the entire Canadian rail network. It was this big thing. And uh, I looked into it because uh, again, my St. John subscriber told me about it. And then Fun fact, they're like, oh, sorry, we're only selling 1,700 of those. They basically, they turn down free money because they're like, oh, we don't know how that'll affect us. Don't be so, you know, when you're in a business that's losing so much money, feel free to try stuff for out of the wall. That's what Canada's rail needs to do. You can't, you know, they can't afford to just be like throwing more money at new routes or anything because in Canada, building these railroads is expensive. But if you have them already and you've got the trains to operate them, Try and get more people on those trains because it's better than not doing so. <laughs> I'm no business person though. And if you wanted to fix the Canadian air network, I would say first of all, try at least tr you know, experiment with privatizing airports. If it doesn't work for your country, if the people in this, you know, if you privatize Edmonton Airport and everyone goes crazy and is like, oh, that's not good, then that sucks. But a lot of the airports are trying new things uh, right now, like Calgary is going to be a new huge hub for WestJet for international flights. Again, they decided they'd make more money internationally than they would within Canada. The fact that that's the case means you have a problem with your system. At least, ex sorry, at least experiment with different things. Second of all is, uh, you know, overflight fees. That's a thing you can obviously work on. Third of all, no foreign carriers are allowed to operate on Canadian soil. And this is a rule a lot of countries have. Like, oh yeah, because you got you to protect Air Canada and WestJet. They're the, the national carriers. And like, okay, that's fine. If you don't want, if you don't want, for instance, Saudi Arabian Airlines operating from Montreal to Vancouver, or you don't want American Airlines operating from Calgary to Winnipeg, or you don't want, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep naming airlines here. You don't want Iberia to operate from, <laughs> you know, like Yellowknife to Regina. Sure, okay. You're literally turning down foreign carriers being able to operate the routes that aren't being really operated right now, competitively. But at least one of the things Canada is really horrendous at is allowing other airlines to fly into the country at all. For instance, Canada signed a deal with UAE, which only allows them six flights a week to Canada. The whole of the country can have six flights from uh, you know, Dubai, which means that even if you want to get to Canada from another country to another country, there's only six flights we have the opportunity to, and they still all pay those other fees. Allow as many air, you know, other countries to operate flights into your country, and maybe give them the ability to operate flights from your country to your country, you know, Fifth Freedom, I think it's called, do, as, do what you can to increase competition within the country. And even though there's going to be some people being like, oh, that's it. Because, you know, basically by not doing so, you're subsidi subsidizing uh, Canada and uh, not subsidizing. You're like, you're blocking foreign competition to your own airlines. Let your own airlines compete on the quality of them. Air Canada is an airline I really want to fly personally. So is the new WestJet uh, Calgary operations. That, 
make your airlines, one, be competitive, but two, you know, in terms of price, but also in terms of quality, and then you'll have a better airline experience that will hopefully be cheaper. Because, again, the same thing is true of airlines. Because they charge $350 right now, if you wanted to charge $100, you'd need 3.5 times as many passengers and uh, taxes, fees, all that sort of stuff. Work on it, Canada. That's how you get people across the country easier. And, uh, yeah, that's a thing. You might not know about Canada. So many great things to say about it. So, it's, it's one of my favorite countries in the world. But getting around Canada is not easy. And although part of that is just a geography problem, and part of that is just a genuine political choice on Canada's part. And I mentioned earlier how some of the provinces of Canada joined Canada under the promise of being connected to the rest of it by railroad and roads, etc. So, you know, some of that has to be done for political reasons and has to be maintained in an expensive way for political reasons. Um, and there's also the uh, part of the fact that, you know, Canada, uh, you know, despite, uh, you know, one of the choices they make, I guess, is to be a very protectionist heavy country. Look up the milk monopoly sometime. Uh, you can bring cannabis across Canada if you want to. You can't bring milk across provincial borders on a technical level uh, and, you know, across uh, into America River. There's a lot of funny facts like this where, like, Canada has a big thing for protectionism. They're a very, very left-leaning country, which is something, you know, you, you might hate or you might love. Uh, but the truth is that does mean that there's a lot of protectionism for Canada's industries, even if they're not great for the Canadian people. If they're good for the company, that's good for a different set of people, which is the people uh, that are preferred by the Canadian government. And also having high taxes is something that Canadians, one, I guess, you know, like, uh, uh, just accept as a thing, and two, require for all of the public services that Canada does, does, does have. You know, to, to cut the taxes in, for instance, an airline ticket, they need to make up that money somewhere else and you know like that's a tricky thing to do in a country that is already quite high tax like Canada and uh, yeah that's a uh, you know that's a big thing with the country of like if you want to lower the costs and you know cut the regulations in some ways you're gonna have costs to pay on the other end and in a country like Canada which um, again it's uh, not necessarily very very it's not like socialist left it's not even social democratic as much as uh, you know Sweden Norway the Nordic model it is still very much on that side of things which means it's going to have higher costs and honestly that's a political decision that might be worth making in your head it's fine to accept that like yeah if we have to suffer in this way in exchange for this that's the thing that I'm always I I'm I'm happy when people make those decisions but what makes me unhappy is when people think you can have your cake and eat it too if you do one thing you don't get the other if you do the other thing you don't get one necessarily sometimes you can use one thing as a means to get to the other or so on and so forth um, but there is a political decision that does have to be made in some of these places and you know given that they have a lot of other priorities as a country I guess it's not something that any Canadian pre uh, you know premier or any Canadian election has really focused on and uh, yeah uh, I guess you know, make Canada super wealthy so it can just, uh, you know, work on the rocket transportation method across the country is uh, a solution you could see as the real uh, fix for the problem too. Uh, it's, it's an interesting thing and uh, it's just something I wanted to mention. Like I said, love Canada. Uh, you know, even love like, you know, th there's a lot of cool things they do in government. There's a lot of cool uh, things that only happen in Canada, such as legalization. Everyone's on board with that, right? But yeah, trade-offs uh, are involved with everything. If you think there's no trade, if you think you vote for something and it's purely going to make your country, you know, any political decision with very few exceptions, that's pure upside, truth is, you know, life is about trade-offs, right? You know, that's that's how things actually work in the real world outside of elections, outside of catchy slogans, and uh, hopefully uh, outside of internet videos or inside of internet videos. I'm not even sure. So before we go today, like I said, uh, Canada is one of those countries, every time I go, even though they give me some real hassle, uh, <laughs> I still always want to go back. I loved my time in Canada. I love being subscribers from Canada. So given that a lot of you who are watching this video might be from Canada, uh, so I've been to Toronto, I've been to Vancouver, uh, kind of like almost by accident, long story in that one, uh, and I've been to the Maritimes, or at least a couple of them. Uh, high up on the to-go list is Quebec City, oh sorry, Montreal, which is like Quebec's, real Quebec City. Quebec's the city, that's the capital, that's the biggest city. So Montreal, which is obviously the closest part, or Montreal, I know, whatever, but you know, the closest part of uh, one of the closest big cities to the UK. Uh, there's frequent flights, they're not necessarily so cheap or whatever, um, but the, there is also flights to Calgary. Uh, Calgary's starting to become a major international hub. Like I said, WestJet has like a new interesting service going out there that's gonna be crazy cheap for a lot of different reasons. So Calgary and Montreal are both very high up on the like, 
would like to go some time list, and my pros and cons right now are just like, well, they're two cities I haven't been to, and Montreal is French speaking, which is a downside, but poutine is an upside, and they have that crazy cool, uh, you know, under I think it's underground uh, walkway system, like the path in Toronto, but even better supposedly, so that would be interesting, and the culture shock are like, hey, it's French Canadians that don't really like being called French, or don't, don't really like being called Canadians really either, uh, that'd be interesting, or Calgary is like, oh, this is the, the up and coming part of, uh, you know, Canada, the part that's making it richer and richer as uh, time goes on. Uh, and also, the other thing that's like a pro on the Calgary side is they have a, uh, I think it's called the Luke, that funny uh, kinetic energy thing. I love it, it's, it's an interesting thing. So if you have any pros and cons though, if you're like, you have to go to Calgary for this, 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 because you love geography, you'll love this, I'd love to hear your recommendations. Because you know, this, this channel, uh, although it is hopefully about discussing the important issues, it's also sometimes fun to be like, you know, where should one go? If anyone is also deciding between where to go in Canada, read those comments too, maybe. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it, because I won't see you in another one second channel. Don't care. Goodbye.